Good morning. Um, let's kick us off. So welcome everybody to BDO's webinar focused on professional services firms. My name is Anna Gerald, for those who I don't know already. I am the tax partner leading our professional services tax team in the UK. BDO is a global accounting network with over 9 billion US dollars of revenues, providing auditing and accounting taxation services in over 160 countries. And we've got over 100, sorry, 80,000 people now. The topic on our agenda today is US tax. So focused on the tax and not the politics, but what a day to choose to do this on. Uh, we had hoped to be in a position at this stage to know which political party would be in the White House and therefore focus on the tax regime that we'd be expecting to see being implemented going forward. But we're not quite clear on who's going to be sat in that White House now, so we'll be exploring the potential tax regimes that could be introduced, as well as reminding everybody of the current tax position. So we've got a couple of brave speakers talking, and that is Nitin Nike and Ashley Graham. So thank you both for, for speaking today. Just to introduce you to them both, Nitin is an associate director with over 10 years of experience providing US and UK dual handling tax advice and compliance services. Nitin is an enrolled agent licensed to practice before the Internal Revenue Service in the US. And Nitin advises UK based citizens, sorry, UK based US citizens with a specific focus on private equity and professional services firms as well as entrepreneurs. He also specialises in pre-US residency tax planning. Ashley, Ashley Graham, is a dual qualified US and UK tax senior manager. Ashley's got experience of advising US people that are operating in UK businesses in the UK. With a focus on US international tax matters such as controlled foreign corporations and passive foreign investment companies. Ashley also advises individuals and businesses that are looking to expand into the US market. As we know, there's a big crossover between the UK and US in professional services, and therefore Nitin and Ashley are both well-versed in working with professional services firms, and our team keep them rather busy. As we move to the webinar itself, um, you can ask questions during the webinar, so please use that Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We'll address any questions that we can, um, at the end of the webinar, or if we can't get to them because time doesn't permit, given the quantity of things that we need to talk about, we'll deal with them after the webinar. We'll also recording and we'll send you the email deck as well as the recording in a few days. We will complete our, our conversation within the hour. So now I'll hand over to Ashley. Ashley. Hi everyone, thanks very much for joining. Um, yeah, as, as Anna said, um, we'll try and focus on, on the tax um, as much as we can, but yeah, there's been a lot going on over the last couple of days. Ashley, I've, I've lost you. Apologies. My, I think my internet keeps dropping off, um, so I'll, I'll try and press ahead. Can you hear me, hear me now? You can, yep, you're back, yep. Um, so yeah, I was just, I was just saying, um, Hopefully we'll have a decision on on um, on the next president and what we, how we can plan going forward. Um, Nitin will lead into that a little bit later on. Um, and what I'll start with is kind of a review of the current landscape, um, how we've how we've been looking at things after all the changes we had in 2017, um, and a few extra additional things that have come up over the last month or so um, in relation to guidance to things that are relevant to, to sales of partnerships. Um, so. If we go to the next slide, we've got the, the, the main changes that we see from um, the, the, the review of 2017. Um, so, so the main aim by Trump was to, to reduce some of the tax um, by giving breaks to, to everyone. He, he sold it as, um, but a lot, of the, a lot of people believed it was giving breaks to, to, to corporates rather than individuals. So the main headlines were that they lowered the US individual tax rate from 39.6 to 37. They lowered the US corporate tax rate from a graduated rate up to 35% as a maximum rate down to a flat hit of 21. So the, you can see the big difference between allowing um, a flat rate of 21% against 31% for corporates and only a 2.6% uh, reduction for individuals. Hence why people think it was actually 
more aimed towards corporates and people that have um, real estate, which is what Donald Trump has. Um, <laughs> there's, they, they also reduced, it included a new business interest limitation where generally there is, there is only allowed interest, a deduction against your income on, uh, based on 30% of your taxable income. Um, there is a creation of a, a minimum tax on controlled foreign corporations. So the, the US always perceived you, any US person, any corporate or individual that invest outside of the US as if they're um, tri- taking money in and, and reducing the economy of the US. So they always try and penalize them as, as much as possible. Um, so they, they basically in, in, in introduced this new regime whereby if a US person owns a controlled foreign corporation or a US business, owns a foreign corporation, then there's effectively a minimum tax on that corporation. And the way that works is, is they look at all of the assets of this foreign corporation and any income in excess of 10% of their net depreciable assets is taxed in the US under this new um, global intangible law taxed income or guilty regime. There are certain allowances and deductions allowed for US domestic corporations, such as a 50% deduction of the overall income amount that aren't allowed for individuals. Um, so th- there is some other planning that can be done for individuals around getting them elections, um, but that's something that needs to be to be thought about from the outset. They also brought in um, and codified the withholding tax on the sale of a, a partnership that has a US trade or business. Um, so that's a major change in, in, in the way that they operate a withholding tax and tax um, trades and businesses of, of partnerships and when they're when they are sold, bought and sold between the partners. They also brought in a pass-through deduction for all specific trades or, or businesses in, in the US. Um, so it was it was it was tried to be seen as it's an additional deduction to reduce the individual business rate for, for people that are operating as partnerships. So because they reduced the corporate rate so much from 35 to 21, but only the individual rate so little. They, they included an additional deduction against the partnership profits that can then reduce a partner's allocable profits from that partnership. However, there was a huge caveat to that, that there was a, a lot of a lot of trades and businesses were, were exempt and weren't allowed to take that trade or business deduction. Um, and professional services, there was a blanket, any service that looks or smells like a professional service, effectively don't get it. So unfortunately, um, it's not generally available. So, so on the next slide, um, this, this, a bit more detail about the sale of a partnership with a trade or business in the US. So there is, there is some new regulations released, not final regulations, kind of initial guidance regulations only two, two months ago in September. So it's taken, you can imagine, since 2017 to, to now to release them, that guidance. So we've been kind of trying to work out how we do this over the last three years without any guidance, but we've finally got that. It's not final, so it's not, it's not actually law, but we have been, um, we have seen releases and notices from there and we can, we can rely on these. So the history of the whole sale of a partnership against um, US trade or business has been a long standing battle between the IRS and the taxpayer. So the IRS long standing view has been that effectively any trade or business within the US should be taxable in the US. Whereas the taxpayers always said, well, they're selling a partnership interest. It's not actually selling a trade or business. So we, we shouldn't be subject to tax. So there's always the age long argument against entity or the form. Are you selling all of the assets of the partnership or are you selling the partnership? Because in the US, they look at the entity more so than they look at the underlying assets of the partnership like we're doing in the UK. Um, so, so, so that's always been a battle. And then there was a very famous case called the Grecian Magnetized case in 2017, which actually sided with the taxpayer. And it agreed that the sale of a partnership, even if it has ECI, is not effectively a sale of a trade or business in the US. So it's not subject to US tax. And that was around, I think it was around April, April or May 2017, that was, that was, that was uh, opined upon. So the position was made clear. However, at the end of 2017, the the lawmakers decided, well, we're just going to override that by making this now a law because it wasn't previously written into the law. So in the end of 2017, they basically codified it and made it legal that 
going forward and it's sale of the partnership is exactly back into the decision before the Grecian Magnetise case. So a win for the IRS. Um, so basically, it basically impacts when a, a non-US person sells a partnership interest, there's potential withholding in relation to the amount of the gain that has US trade or business, which is referred to as ECI or effectively connected income. So basically on the sale of a partnership, there's a deemed disposal of all of the assets of that partnership in order to create, a, to, to calculate a ratio of US over non-US trade or business. And that, that percentage then is, is impacted on the amount of gain from the partnership sale, it, which is US sourced, which is taxed in the US. It can also apply when a partnership distributes to a partner in excess of their basis. So what that is in the US, so the basis for is a, a partner's interest in a partnership. So the way that we look at it in the US is a partnership interest in a partnership is a base cost. So when you when a partner contributes to a partnership, that increases their base cost. And then additional income from that partnership again increases the base cost because that is seen as already being taxed. Actually, you look like you're frozen again. That doesn't seem to be working. I think what we should do, um, if we can, our event support, if you wouldn't mind, just moving forward to knit in slides and we can come back to Ashley's um, if he manages to rejoin us. There we go. Um, so a little bit earlier than anticipated, but that's no problem. <laughs> um, Ash was giving us a very uh, useful overview of the situation as it is and that's and that's great that's that's the rules that are in force at the moment um, this next section is extremely topical as anna was saying um, and a little bit more speculative so when we were putting this deck together a couple of weeks ago we were slightly concerned that some of the content may not be relevant because we'd have uh, a firm result in the election but uh, as we're all seeing at the moment there, there isn't clarity, so it's going to be of value for everyone to understand what the differences are between the two um, potential congressional and presidential um, policy plans. And it's been interesting actually speaking to my client base over the course of the last few months because fiscal policy doesn't seem to have been such a big driver, certainly for my client base. Um, what we're seeing from the election is that actually the economy has been very high on people's agenda. Um, it's been higher than certain social issues, it's been higher than even the COVID response. So the economy always really matters um, to people. As I said, it, that wasn't really reflected in my client base. Um, I'd imagine everyone on this call will have some touch point to the US already, hence, hence why this is relevant to you. So perhaps you have branches in the US, perhaps you have US citizen partner, partner population, or you're looking to expand in the US. Um, this is relevant in all those situations, especially for US citizen partners who are resident in the UK. And it's important to make or reiterate uh, the point that the US tax system for individuals is non-territorial. So if you're a US citizen, doesn't matter where you live, you are subject to the same rules, whether you live in London as to whether you live in New York, same federal rules. And that kind of drives a lot of the tax planning that I get involved in, certainly. My, my background, as Anna said, is, is more on the individual side, but I do a lot of work with the professional services team to, to help them with these kind of issues. So there's going to be a mixture here of individual taxation that, that's potentially going to be more relevant to your partner population, as well as potential changes on the business. Um, as I said, at the moment, it's all a little bit speculative, but, uh, but we'll, we'll see. It's good to have an idea of both plans. Um, if you are interested in any more information, then there was an article that my team drafted a, a couple of weeks ago called Red Corner versus Blue Corner, and I'm, I'm sure we can share the link. That gives a nice summary of, of all the potential changes, but actually, that's, that's all included within the slide deck that can be shared anyway. Um, there's an important point on this slide, which is actually the date of swearing in of the, of the next president or, or the re-inauguration of the current president. Um, the reason is some of these changes will offer planning opportunities. Um, 
and people will always want to know what's the date that any prospective changes will come in. Now, the answer is we don't know, but generally it takes about 12 months to, to get any kind of reform through, maybe more, and then usually in the US it's backdated to the start of that year. So all the reforms that Ash has spoken about in terms of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, they came into effect the 1st of January 2018. President Trump came into office at the end of 2016. So that's the kind of time frame you're looking at. That's really important for any prospective planning, whether that's from a business perspective or an individual perspective. Um, we need to understand when or how much time we have. To be very conservative, you would say that we have until the end of 2020 for any kind of planning opportunity at the moment to take, to take advantage of their own beneficial regimes at the moment um, or any regimes that just seem more appropriate. It would be aggressive if there were a change of president and then any tax reforms were backdated to the 1st of January 2021. The reason being, as you can see there, that um, the president is not sworn in until the 20th of January 2021. So in actuality, it would be backdating it to a period before the president was even in office. That's an assumption. There has been precedent for um, electoral, sorry, for tax reform to come in prior to the date of swearing in. In fact, uh, Bill Clinton was someone who did that. Unusual though. So in terms of space for any planning up to the end of this year, or maybe end of this year and then next year, but we don't know. It'd be conservative to consider it's the end of the, um, excuse me, this year. Um, and in terms of planning opportunities, if there are, if there is anything that you think would be appropriate, then please speak to your BDO contact. And if it's US relevant, they can get either one of myself or, or Ashley into, involved. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please, Jade? So it's really important actually to understand before we talk about the reforms, what the likelihood is of those reforms coming in. And that is very much based on, on actually how the US government um, works. And it's very different to the UK. We're all familiar with the UK in that we vote for a political party. And if that party gets past the post, then they can form a government. And what that means is, because you're voting for the party, um, certainly in England, you have a party with a majority that can form a government. They can generally get their legislative, legislative agenda through um, without too much problems, uh, without too many problems, as long as the members of those party adhere to the party whips. So that means if you've got a government in the UK, they can generally change the law pretty easily. The US is different and um, the global news is always dominated by the presidential election. Now the presidency is the executive, that is one part or one branch of, of US government. And the executive is, is, as it says, it's the executive, it's there to execute the laws um, that are passed. The Houses of Congress are the legislative body. So those houses, which consist of the lower house, which is the House of Representatives, and the, and the upper house, which is the Senate, are as important as the presidency. Because if you have a split between those two parties, then it can be harder for that legislation to get through. And that's relevant. We've got a snapshot here of how things are at the moment. Now, based on the current predictions, we may have a change of presidency. We may have the Biden uh, administration coming in, but it looks as though the Senate will stay in Republican hands. So that means a lot of the reforms that I'll talk about coming up to coming up in a second, it, it may be harder for them to get through. And certainly the last four years of the Obama administration were characterized really by frustration, by the fact that he had a legislative agenda that he couldn't get through because there was a Republican Senate. So there may be a lot of bipartisanship um, and there may even be changing of this tax plan that, that Joe Biden has 
um, in order to make it more amenable to a, a Republican Senate. Excuse me. So we can see there's also a huge US deficit uh, at the bottom that is only going to grow um, in, 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 but due to the um, uh, expansion of spending because of the COVID response. Um, I know one of Ash's slides was going to address that. So hopefully at some point we can go back and, and deal with it. There was a specific act called the CARES Act that was passed last year that uh, included a lot of reforms, which is one of the updates we we're gonna go through. Um, but yeah, important to understand that Biden is actually relatively moderate compared to a lot of the rest of the Democratic Party, but he may be forced to become even more moderate in terms of his prospective changes if he becomes president, because it's unlikely that there will be a clean sweep um, of Democrats across the House of Representatives the Senate and the presidency. The third branch of the US government is, uh, is um, the Supreme Court, so the judiciary. Um, and that's relevant because there is a very important um, piece of legislation called the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, which is actually coming up to Supreme Court challenge, as in it is being challenged in the Supreme Court in a week's time. Now, if that is successful, that challenge, that means your US citizen partners um, would immediately be uh, no longer subject to an additional 3.8% tax that they currently pay on investment income. So it would make a, a big impact actually to the bottom line of high earners who are subject to what's called the net investment income tax, which is part of the Affordable Care Act. Um, as people may know, there is a, uh, a conservative 6-3 majority on, in the Supreme Court at the moment. Not that that should affect any decision, but we wait and see. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please, um, please Jay? So again, this is, this is just setting the, the context. So a lot of the changes that um, Ash was talking us through that relate to the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, if we don't see a change, in the presidency, what will happen or what we expect is actually less change in the current tax environment. Um, a lot of the provisions in the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act were what we call sunsetted. So they were temporary and they were due to expire at the end of 2025. Um, if President Trump is re-elected, what we can expect to see is an extension of that sunsetting to the extent that they are now permanent changes. Some of those big changes that, that Ash was mentioning, um, a reduction in the top rate of, of income tax from 39.6% to 37%. Again, that's, that's a headline rate for your, for your partners. Um, and then also a uh, big cut in um, corporation tax from 35% to 21%. So really significant change. Um, we had the introduction of the global intangible low tax income provisions, again, that Ash was talking about. All of those would be um, extended past 2025. So to a certain extent, that gives us um, a little bit more clarity going, going forward, as in we know those provisions are going to be around for a while. The other really big one for a lot of my clients is the gift and estate tax exemption. So the US has a very, very high exemption for um, either gifting or assets passing on death. Again, this is really important for, for planning purposes for a lot of our clients. Um, that, that exemption is currently at uh, $11.58 million. So that's for a single person before they start paying the US equivalent of inheritance tax. So it's extremely generous. Um, that's currently the level and that's generally a fairly big um, uh, political issue that tends to move depending on the presidency and the, and the formation of the government. Um, and the, the final point on that slide is about, again, the response to, to COVID and how um, a Republican presidency would seek about funding and dealing with that, that big deficit that's only ever going to get bigger. The, 
<laughs> the context of obviously a Republican administration is through expansion of the economy. So increasing tax takes by actually keeping tax rates where they are, certainty in the environment and um, incentivizing investment. That, that's going to be in contrast to um, the Democrats slightly. Um, Jade, if we could go to the next slide, please. So this looks more likely based on the current projections, a, a Biden presidency with, with Harris as um, vice president. Their tax plan, and we'll, we'll come to their headline rates in a second, um, that projects a $4 trillion tax plan over 10 years. So that's a, that's a big fiscal expansion to try and deal with that deficit. Um, they've actually been very bullish though about keeping taxes as they are for anyone earning less than $400,000. So as you can tell, when you're keeping those tax rates um, steady for people on that level of income, it, it's the high earners, um, so potential law firm partners, um, or a lot of people who work in, in industries and people on this call will, who, who may be affected more heavily by those tax changes. Um, they, they don't want the burden of that big fiscal expansion to fall on the middle classes, and that $400,000 would be considered the middle class in the, in the US. Um, again, that last point, big difference between the two, um, two potential administrations is that dealing with the deficit and dealing with the COVID response would probably be about um, expansion of fiscal policy. So increasing taxes broadly, as opposed to um, keeping them where they are. Uh, and again, that Affordable Care Act, if we remember my previous points about the Supreme Court and the challenge coming in a week's time, um, again, we can see a big difference. That may be struck down in a week's time and deemed unconstitutional. But if it isn't, and we have a Biden presidency, potentially we see an expansion of it. And that means potentially a wider scope of of tax or investment tax for people who have substantial um, investment earnings. Great, Nitin, just um, if you've got to the end of that slide, I think, believe we've got Ashley back on the line now. Unfortunately, we haven't got a videoed Ashley, but we do have a telephone Ashley. Um, so we'll go back to, um, to Ashley. Ashley, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can, yes, wonderful. Right, so Ashley, could you Perfect. guide Jade which, to which slide you would like to... If we go to slide 10, please. There we go. Yeah. So I, th I think where we ended, we're always talking about the 10% withholding for the proceeds amount by the purchaser, um, and then that could be passed on to the partnership where the withholding is not done correctly. So the withholding will be, be something that the partnership would have to do uh, on any distributions it makes to the to the incoming partner, there are various exemptions to that. So, for example, where there's where it's a US partner and the withholding doesn't apply, um, where there's no gain on the sale of the partnership, there, there should be no withholding that applies. There are de minimis amounts um, where there's only a small amount of ECI or US trade or business income inside the partnership, so there's de minimis amounts of they're around ten percent, um, and then it looks at a three year period of having ECI of the 10% and each having less than a million dollars. So, um, then there's also looking at the tax treaty, the US UK tax treaty or US and whatever the, the, the selling partner, this jurisdiction is their tax treaty to see whether that, that sale is taxable under the tax treaty. So I think technically what, what we're really saying is any, any sale of a partnership needs to be looked at this where it has a US, US business, any sort of ECI within the partnership and needs to be looked at in terms of whether there is any withholding, whether it's going to be done by the purchaser, um, whether it needs to be looked at by the partnership itself if it's not done correctly, um, and then most importantly, if any of the de minimis exemptions apply, is there going to be the most important ones? We, we will see. Yeah, so I think what you're saying there, Ashley, is that um, for a UK partnership where there's a US branch, if there's any transfer of a partner in, into the UK partnership or out, that th this could be the sort of the factual situation could be affected by this yes yes exactly we'd need to give it some thought definitely yeah okay so if we go to the next slide um so the response the us's response to the the current pandemic the coronavirus act is is the cares act which was 
signed into law in March 2020. And they've done a, a draft of changes to try and improve the economy and, and give people um, some more money to be able to, to get through this pandemic as, as people are not able to work. So if we, if we flip on to the next slide, um, there were stimulus payments that were made to, to, to families where checks were sent to different families if they earned less than $99,000. Um, they waived certain penalties on distributions of certain retirement plans to allow people to, to get money out that they're saving for their future, to get money out now early to be able to, to get through this, this, these difficult times. They increased the limit of charitable deductions, so individuals in the US are allowed to take a deduction on their personal return for charitable donations. So they wanted to increase that a little bit more so then the charities can go out there and do their good work. So there's been an increase of that. And there's also been small business loans to certain sectors. So the government have been giving small loans to, to certain, certain businesses. Um, on the actual um, tax side, rather than the money coming from the government, they have they've made a few changes. They've increased uh, the net operating loss. So when a business has a, has a loss, and previously, you were only able to deduct 80% of that against your taxable income. Um, however, they've increased that so you can, you can deduct 100% of that and you can carry it back up to five years. Um, the, the second one, they've increased the amount of interest deductibility that, that you can deduct against your income. You, you, I mentioned earlier how that was brought in under the Trump administration in 2017. So effective from 2018, you had a deduction of 30% of your, of your taxable income could be deducted for, for interest payments that you have. That was increased to 50% for 2019 and 2020. So with them, them two in mind, it's, it's quite, they quite work well together in that you can increase your deduction for interest, which increases or, or gives you a net operating loss. And you can then carry that back up to five years at 100%. And if you think about the, the tax change the tax change in 2018. So before 2018, the tax rate was 35%. So if you, you increase the net operating loss in 2019 or 2020 and, and carrying that back five years, you're actually getting a 35% tax benefit there, which, which was quite beneficial to some businesses. They've also accelerated the alternative minimum tax credits. So they operate, other than just the federal tax, they have an alternative minimum tax that they, they have a calculation to, to pay that. Sometimes people overpay um, and then it takes a little while to get that money back from the government. They basically just accelerated that and, and give everyone the refunds as, as quick as possible. Yeah. So Jade, Jade, could you just move forward? Um, just one more slide, please. Um, that's the one that um, Ashley's just been talking to. So Ashley, we're now up to date on the slides. Yeah. So then the next slide, we've got some recent activity that we've seen. So I think over the last the last two or three months, we've seen quite a lot of activity on US customers of our UK based clients asking for these form W8. Um, so these forms are, are integral to the withholding system in the US. They, they act as two kind of withholding uh, gatekeepers. They, they act for the general withholding on foreign source of US sourced income for foreign individuals, which is 30%. But they also act as a certification of withholding for, in relation to FATCA at 30% as well. So without these, there's potential of being withheld under both regimes at totaling 60%. Um, the US income withholding requires like analysis of the US and UK tax treaty to determine whether th that percentage of 30% withholding is correct. In, in some cases where you, for example, you don't have any permanent establishment in the US or anything, then they might not be withholding. But in some cases where you do have bits of work in the US, you do have people there, then they might be withholding but it, it does take a careful analysis of the tax treaty to determine what the correct percentage is. It also depends on what type of income it is, if it's trading income or if it's investment type income, the, the rules are completely different. Um, the fact that withholding requires analysis of the, the intergovernmental agreement between the UK and the US. Um, and fact was basically, it was mainly aimed at investment type businesses, but unfortunately everyone has to do it because it has to be completed on this form. Um, and it was kind of the US's US's main aim in this was to stop US people hiding money offshore and investing it offshore and not paying or declaring any US taxes. But it has had a, a, a global impact. I've even seen when you open a bank now, you'll probably be asked if you're a US citizen. The main reason for that is because they want to know if you're a fact, if you have, they have to report you because if you were a US citizen and you open a bank, a bank would be a financial institution. They'd have to report you as a, as a US citizen. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it's because the US operates as a global citizenship tax regime opposed to all of the residency tax regimes we have here. And um, there's a bit of synergy between FATCA reporting and the common reporting standard we, we adopted in the UK and all the other countries adopted. So the bit of synergy between them two and the rules are, are, are similar, but are, there are differences in certain, certain, certain um, definitions. Um, there are different forms required. So form W8, so there's, there's a range of form W8 that are required to certify that you are a, a foreign person um, and whether withholding should be applied or not, depending on the, the structure of the business, depending on the, the person that it relates to. So for instance, a form W8 IMY is for a partnership. Um, a form W8 Ben is for an individual, and then a form W8 Ben is for a company. Um, and this is important because um, the, the tax classification of a business in the US can differ to what we see in the UK. So the classic example is a UK limited liability partnership, an LLP, where we see it as a partnership, it's tax a partnership in, in the UK. But in the US, because there's no one with unlimited liability, it's seen as a corporation. So you can get different treatments between the tax treatment in the US and the UK and the correct form that needs to be filled out, whether it's a partnership or a corporation, just needs to be, to be thought about. Um, and a side note on that, any, any US partners that have any UK LLP, we want to probably give some consideration of making certain elections in the US to be, to be treated as a partnership. So if we, we do have US partners in, in, in UK LLPs, then there is ways to, to, to get partnership treatment in the UK, in the US as well as the UK to match them two treatments so that US partner can manage their foreign tax credits and not pay double taxation. So then the next slide, I think Nitin touched upon the, the, the repeal of the net investment income tax, which is being heard next week. So hopefully we'll have an answer on that. Um, and then, the, the other other item is that at the moment the IRS have got an increased focus on the um, high net worth people with foreign assets. So there's been quite a lot of a lot of movement in that, and they've de developed a new team um, and are building the team out to to um, to target individuals that are that are outside the US that have got foreign assets and not been declaring it. For example, there was there was a case not so long ago where they, they found an individual that had made of up to two billion dollars of tax from the IRS. Um, and they didn't look, look down on that um, too nicely. So it's their biggest windfall and, and, and they, they're pushing that at the moment. And that, that concludes everything on, on my part. So maybe if we pick up from, from Nitin's slides on, on slide 20, Jade. Thanks, Ash. Um, and actually your, your point um, that I just wanted to, that I should have reiterated actually in my initial slides, Going back to the Affordable Care Act, um, for any of you that do have US citizen partners, the, the repeal, if it's found unconstitutional, means they may even be entitled to potential refunds of, of um, that tax going back to 2016. We may actually be out of time to claim a 2016 refund, but 2017, tax year 2017 onwards, there is a potential. So, you have any of those partners um, and that they're, they're unaware of that feel free to refer them to your video contact and can speak to myself or one of my colleagues um, so these are the actual proposed changes based on the tax plans of both um, president trump and uh, the prospective biden presidency I think on this slide what i'd like you to have in your mind is another column that has UK tax rates in them as well. And the reason I say that is that where we really add value is that overlap between the US and the UK. Because we have that non-territorial uh, regime in, in the US for individuals, it means that they can very often be subject, well, they are subject to both taxes by default. So what, what a lot of what we do is manage that di difference between the US and the UK. So changing the headline rates for, um, for a US citizen resident in the UK isn't necessarily a big change because if the UK tax is higher, they'll pay the UK tax and they should get credit for the US tax. Again, to reiterate our point, a lot of what we do is manage the credit uh, position between the US and the UK so that individuals aren't doubly taxed. That, that's really important. 
So if we look at the headline income tax rate, then it's 37% at the moment. Um, under a Republican presidency, we would see that extended beyond 2025. So certainty about the top rate. Uh, that top rate kicks in at quite a high level of income. So for married taxpayers, you're looking at over $500,000 of income. You can see that a Biden presidency would revert it back to 39.6%. So Ash mentioned that that was the rate before Tax Cuts and Jobs Act came in in 2017, um, which came into effect at the start of 2018. Um, and back to my point about trying to protect the middle classes that would only come in over uh, $400,000 worth of, of gross income. So, Again, it's going to be high earners who are primarily affected. However, we have to remember the UK tax rate on income is 45%. So if it's UK sourced, if you've got US citizen partners living in London, um, they, they may not see any effect because they should, all, all that US tax is going to do is be offset by the, their UK tax credit. So does that make a real difference to them? Depends. If you've got people moving out to the US, you know, to your branches or, or you're looking to expand, a um, huge amount of work I've, I've done over the years has been um, helping people who are relocating to the US. And there tends to be a mentality that uh, the US is a, a low tax environment. Um, if they're moving to New York and they've got 39.6% of income tax and then state tax on top of that, uh, they're going to be paying pretty much the same amount of tax, maybe even more. Top rate of New York taxes is just under 9.9%, plus city tax on top of that. So, um, so yeah, it's worth that sort of education for people relocating to the US. It's certainly not a tax holiday and would be even less so under a Biden presidency. Um, now, long-term capital gains, that refers to when you sell an asset that's been held for over 12 months. And that is treated separately to if you hold an asset for less than 12 months. Currently, uh, that capital gain would be taxed at 20%. So we've got a nice symmetry between the US and the UK rate. President Trump would look to reduce that even further to 15%. But President Biden would actually increase that rate. So it's taxed at what we call ordinary income rates, the same rate as income tax for those that have a million dollars or more of income. And that's a huge perspective change for people who may be sitting on large unrealized gains if they're high earners, because that's essentially a doubling of the tax rate. Double what you would pay in the UK on, on that level of gains. So that's where there's a real potential planning opportunity. Um, I mentioned earlier about when these, when these changes might come in, <coughs> excuse me, um, it, it may be that for individuals, if, if there is good reason to do so, um, and there is an investment reason to do so, they may want to speak to someone about planning um, if they're concerned about a very high rate of 39.6% that they may not be able to get credit for. Um, it's very important with gains, actually, they do speak to someone who's got US and UK tax expertise, because how the credits work is a little bit more complicated than, than for income. But that's where um, we're likely to see a lot of activity in our, our client base um, if there is a, a potential change of, of presidency. So the third line, itemized deductions, SALT just means state and local taxes. So I mentioned New York taxes is very high, for example. Um, the US has a much wider regime of deductions than in the UK. So uh, one of the most powerful deductions was if you lived in a very highly taxed state, New York, California, you could take that as a deduction from your federal income. That is something that was actually reduced very significantly under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So a lot of people who lived in New York and California saw their actual tax rates, effective tax rates, increase because they lost a very powerful deduction. Even with that drop in the headline, headline rates of income tax, they, they lost the really big deductions, so they end up paying more. Um, always important with, with US tax, consider deductions as well as, as well as headline income tax rates. Uh, now that 
that would be um, reinstated by Joe Biden, that, that deduction potential to take, but it would be capped at 28%. At the moment, it's capped at $10,000. So that actually could be still quite useful for, for a lot of our clients. For your, for your clients, uh, sorry, for your populations, people who are moving to, to New York or California or other states, that, that's a deduction that could be quite useful for them and brings down their effective tax rate potentially. I don't believe we'd have many um, private equity firms on the call, but it's worth knowing that carried interest, which is something we've all read and heard about, currently qualifies for long-term capital gains tax treatment. So that 20% that treatment you can see a little bit above. Um, that's if you hold it, it's held for three years. Both President Trump and Joe Biden would eliminate that, um, that treatment. And that's probably a bit of a first mover um, approach by the US. It may be that we see other jurisdictions following that trend, but, but that, again, that's, that's even more speculative than, than, than a lot of the, the rest of the content. But we can, we can certainly see that it's something that's been on the agenda in a lot of countries for a while. Uh, can we get to the next slide, please, Jay? So this is reiterating something again that I, I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> A big part of planning for a lot of my clients is about succession planning. There is a huge uh, state, gift and estate tax exemption. So to reiterate that, that refers to both lifetime gifts and um, uh, any kind of estate or what we call inheritance tax in the UK. They're, but they're both um, exempt, sorry, they're both subject to this same very large credit of 11.58 million at the moment. Um, under a Biden presidency, that would halve, and also the step up in basis. Um, what I mean by that is uh, people inheriting the market value of any assets that pass through in states would be eliminated. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on this. I know we're a bit short on time, but again, that's a really important um, planning option that, that if any of your populations want to speak to someone about, we'd be very happy to discuss with them. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please, Jade. So big, big cut in the top level of corporation tax in the US, as, as Ash said in one of his slides, um, it's a flat rate of 21% at the moment due to sunset at the end of 25, so to, due to expire at the end of 2025. Um, Joe Biden would raise it, but only back up to 28%. So not the high 35% that we had prior to, to 2017, 2018. So reinstatement, increase in the tax rate, but, but not quite as, as high as it was. And guilty, which we've mentioned a couple of times, that, that expansion, or sorry, that um, tax that applies to controlled foreign corporations, uh, that would also be doubled in terms of tax rate under a Biden presidency. So I'll, I'll leave it there um, for now to realize again, we're, we're running short on time. Are there any um, questions or is there, is there anything else we can field off the back of that? Yeah, th thanks, Nit <laughs> thanks Nitin and Ashley. Um, there are just a couple of questions that I've got in my mind um, and uh, these might be for you, Nitin. Um, we talked a bit about FATCA. Um, can you just expand a little bit more on whether there's any other additional things that we need to be aware of in relation to FATCA in respect of UK partnerships? Thanks, Anna. I mean, it's a good point, and actually, it's something that we're seeing a lot. And um, I think it's slide 10, Jade, if you can go back to one in the deck. But um, it was, <clears throat> it's really a real increase in the number of our clients who are being issued with these platforms the number of individuals who are being issued with these forms and, and we're seeing them pass across our desk more and more. So it's worth reiterating, um, clients who are doing business in the US, they're generally being issued one of these WA forms when they weren't previously. I'm certainly seeing more of that. So as US firms become much more um, observant about being compliant with FATCA, we're seeing more issuing of these types of forms. Um, Ash talked us through it very, you know, <clears throat> very comprehensively. Um, but I think that the important thing for people to understand is it's just a form that's being given, but they're, they're relatively complex. 
but we may need to do some treaty analysis, we may need to do analysis of intergovernmental um, agreements. So even though it's just a form, but the reality is there could be um, quite a high level of withholding unless we do that analysis. So um, I'd be very surprised if people aren't seeing <coughs> more of those issued, and that could lead to more issues on those couple of points about analysis or what type, what's the right form, potential elections, etc. So don't don't underestimate how how, how much the, or how important those forms are. Yeah, and it sounds like it's worth doing some work before you get issued the form, <laughs> so that you're not you're 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 realising what needs to go on there or whether something needs to be sort of looked at in more detail in order to protect yourself from those, as you say, thirty percent levels of withholding. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And and just a point, really, just around valve partners, and um, most people on the call will be fascinated, I'm sure, by valve partner structures and and have their own um, points. Um, that that's interesting to them. But have you seen any particular issues using valve partners when it comes to the US? Yes, uh, they're a great idea and structure, and again, something we can we can advise on. Um, what can happen, they, they're used very often when people are expanding into the, the US, you can see, um, and that's a way to try and reduce the amount of, uh, or the number of people who have to do reporting. Not, not, every, not every partner in the UK suddenly wants to have to, to see the US return. Um, the, the issue can be where you've got a, a partner in the US who is allocated a large amount of UK profit because uh, perhaps the US firm isn't as profitable yet. Um, <clears throat> The, the issue there really is that if it's UK sourced, we're, we're comfortable that they're going to pay UK tax on that. The HMRC will, will automatically treat it as UK profit and you'll be taxable in the UK. The US should allow a credit. But if you're back, back to my partner who might be sitting in New York, um, there, is no, there is no foreign tax um, credit for state taxes. Yeah. So that's where people can be really stunned, is they're paying potentially 45% income tax, but then they've got that 8.8% state tax, plus potentially city tax on top of that. Mm -hmm. So that can be a really nasty um, surprise. And you know, some firms may, may choose to equalize partners in the, in the early years when they're, when, they're, when they're looking for the firm to become profitable, but, but then of course that's a, that's a big additional cost for the firm, so something to be, be aware of. <clears throat> but that's an issue I've seen um, yeah, pop up, especially when you're in highly taxed states, uh, like I say, like New York and California, which is where the majority of my, my clients are in the US. Yeah, and of course nowadays you wouldn't get people that haven't just got a tax position to consider just UK and US, but also other jurisdictions as well, so the picture becomes more and more complex. And there was just one question on the on the um, Q and A function, um, which related to the types of forms that you would use for an LLP. And I, and I think Ashley, you, you mentioned and you were talking about this earlier. So did you want to pick that one up? Yes. Yeah. So it, it it depends on the US tax status. So that's what we would look at to see what the classification is in the US. So if uh -huh. it's if it's not made an election in the US, then it would default to be treated as a corporation. So we would go with the form W eight Benny which is the form that's re required for a corporate corporation. If there is an election in the US and it's a partnership, then traditionally it'll be a form W8 IMY. Um, and then if it is a W8 IMY and it is a partnership, then the, the partnership itself doesn't usually get um, tax, tax relief, doesn't get benefit of the tax treaty. So we need to look at the individual partners. And if we've got a hundred partners, we'd need to look at each of them and do a W8 Ben for each partner. Um, or we, we need to look up the chain until we get to a tax paying person effectively. So, I mean, briefly, the, the answer will be it depends on the tax status, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's why all the planning and the structuring around all these things becomes really important when you start looking at not just the tax leakage, but also the administration um, and whether it's actually practically possible to implement some of these things. Can I just add, like, very quickly, Anna, on that? that the, the really, I guess, useful part of being issued that form is that it, it, it starts to clarify potential other issues. So if, um, if that LLP doesn't have a US citizen partner at the moment, that's, that gives us a potential window of opportunity to make those elections that, that Ash, or make that election that Ash is talking about. Um, and that might be 
beneficial going forward if there are going to be any sort of US citizen partners. For a lot of clients, we're acting in retrospect or in hindsight, looking to see if we can come to a position because it's something that only comes to light once they have um, US citizen partner population. Yep, I understood. Okay, well, I'm sure we could carry on talking about this um, all day, if not uh, longer. And um, I'm sure you're interested in seeing how the, uh, the election pans out over the next few days. Um, that brings us to the end of the webinar. Thank you both very much for, uh, to our speakers, Nitin and Ashley. Um, if there are any questions that anyone has that comes out of this, please do let us know. You know, as you can tell, that we're, we're steeped in these sorts of things on a, on a daily basis. Um, I've mentioned before that we will send through the recording and the slides in the next few days. And, and thank you all to our listeners for, for bearing with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>